Welcome everybody uh, to North Fork Audubon Society. We're, we're a local chapter, for those of you who don't know, of National Audubon. That's how National Audubon works. We all are local chapters, <clears throat> therefore we rely on local funding. So you are all welcome to donate. Um, you can go on our website, northforkaudubon.org and um, donate button there. Um, we would appreciate that. And um, also, if you would like to be added to our email list for future programs, you can email us at info at northforkaudubon.org. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Brian. So Brian Rusnica, he lives in, he's coming to us from Cambridge, Massachusetts tonight, which is one of the great things about Zoom. Um, and he's originally from upstate New York. He's president of the Eastern Massachusetts Hawk Watch. He's been on the board for several years there. And he also is an observer for the Plum Island Spring Hawk Watch site, which I didn't know there was one until I read about this. Um, and he also is a wildlife photographer and graphic designer. He specializes, of course, in birds of prey. So uh, Brian, thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to you. Oh, and by the way, I should, sorry, I should add, if any of you have questions, of course, um, just please add them to the chat um, screen and we will have a Q&A after Brian's presentation. Great, thank you so much, Peggy. And, and thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. Uh, thanks to all of you for, for showing up uh, for uh, this discussion. Uh, I'm going to be talking about winter raptor ID, and um, I'm just going to dive right in. We've got um, quite a lot of information to cover, so what I'm going to do tonight is, is really give an overview of um, all the birds of prey that, that you might see in the, in the northeastern U.S. during winter, and I'm going to make sure that these slides are available for folks um, after the presentation so that you can kind of review all the content uh, at your own speed. And then there's some bonus slides at the end that I don't think we'll have time to talk about, but those will be, you know, hopefully useful uh, to you as a, a birder. <clears throat> I like to start all of my programs talking about birding ethics. And I think the American Birding Association really um, sets a great standard for, for birding ethics. And there's some just very simple rules. Uh, Number one is uh, respect and promote birds in their environment. When we're talking about raptors, they're very susceptible to um, certain things that, that folks do that's, that um, are, are problematic, um, you know, disturbing nests, baiting, intentional flushing, flash photography for owls. Um, these are the types of things that we want to, um, you know, not participate in in order to respect birds in their environment. Uh, limiting human impact and in, in any way uh, when we're observing or photographing raptors is, is incredibly important. And I think that um, the ABA sets a, gr a great standard here. I've got a link to the, the full code of ethics for you to review and they've updated it pretty recently. So always good to refresh yourself. A um, Couple other um, standards there, respect and promote the burning community and its individual members, pretty common sense. And again, respect and promote the law and the rights of others. I like to think of myself as a, a birder ambassador anytime I'm out in the field. And I also want to seek ethical guides and ethical organizations that, that follow these principles. We um, call out unethical behavior um, and continue to learn. Um, ethics is a, is a lifelong process and we should never assume that we know it all. Some goals for this workshop today, I want to talk about why winter is so great for um, observing raptors and, and the, the very absolute minimum basics about migration. Um, also, just introducing how to identify raptors and the technique. Uh, I'll talk about the species that we'll see in this area. Um, 12 diurnal raptors, four owls, and then some uh, rarities. And then for tomorrow, you know, what I want to do, again, is give you some places to go next if this piques your interest in terms of media for raptor ID and organizations to join or follow. And again, some bonus slides uh, at the end. Uh, about me, um, thank you for the, uh, Peggy for the introduction. Um, I'll just add that all the things that I do related to birds are, are volunteer positions. I, I, I don't get paid. And, and I think that that's um, something that I wanna just underscore because you, everybody here can get involved with a local organization and um, you know you can make uh, birds a part of your life and, and their conservation a part of your life. And um, I think that all, all of these um, grassroots organizations like North Fork Audubon Society really run on, the, uh, on that volunteer um, 
spirit. Um, there's a couple of links here to my different projects uh, if you get a chance to review them. Um, I also want to call out the Raptor ID Facebook group. That's a 14,000 person group and every day we practice Raptor ID. Um, so we get species from all over the country and it's a great way to, to brush up. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about why winter and why we're, we're here and what's great about winter birding for raptors. You know, the basics of migration are that, that birds move um, due to resource availability. They follow uh, food availability and then they follow nesting location um, availability. And these migrations happen twice a year in this area, once in the fall, once in the spring. And that migration connects these birds uh, and connects their wintering grounds with their breeding grounds. For some species, it's, those are two drastically different locations, but for some species, they don't migrate at all. Um, a couple terms that you might hear me use tonight are permanent resident versus migrant. So a permanent resident, again, a bird that we could find in um, Suffolk County uh, any day of the year. A migrant might be a bird that we only see in the winter. Uh, we also have short distance versus long distance migrants. Short distance could just go down to uh, Virginia for the, for the winter. Long distance birds, uh, birds of prey might go to South America. And total versus partial migrant. Total migrants means the entire population of that bird is, is gone for the season. Uh, and partial means that some of them come and some of them go. Okay, why winter for observing raptors? Uh, for the birds themselves, migration offers improved food opportunities um, and also an expansion of the territorial range when these birds aren't breeding. So you'll get to observe um, different behaviors. And for birds that, that breed north of, of us, um, it's just going to be easier to, to collect and secure food than it will be in a, you know, a snowy, barren landscape. Um, so those are the reasons why birds of prey come here. For us, um, the benefits are that we get to see these different migrant species. And for um, some birds, we get to see just larger quantities of them. Bald eagle jumps to my mind when I think about this, that we just see a lot more eagles that come down, even though we might be able to see them all year round in uh, Long Island. Um, birds of prey are generally less secretive and less sensitive compared to nesting season. Um, we can see them better without foliage uh, blocking our views and snow cover is also great for identifying birds and uh, it provides just great light for photography. All right, here's a real quick crash course in identification technique. Uh, what we wanna do as observers for Raptor ID is use a combination of field marks. That includes the shape, the flight style and the plumage of a bird. The best identifications, the when we can be the most sure are when we can combine different uh, field marks to uh, lock down that ID. The best advice I've ever received about uh, Raptor ID is to learn the basics well. And that's what I'm gonna talk tonight about. You know, there's a lot of information out there that I would consider minutia and you can learn that later and you can always um, brush up on that when you have time. But learning the basics well will, will never fail you because most of these small details cannot be seen in the field. They cannot be seen without a great close photograph but the, the basics of raptor identification will always uh, serve you well. A couple of disclaimers about raptor ID. Um, think like students, not like experts. I do not like to use the word expert, definitely not about myself. As, as I said, I don't have a formal biological um, background, uh, uh, no formal education in, in birds of prey. Uh, I'm just a student, you know, uh, observing, um, birds in the environment and, and reading up on the, the published literature. Um, so uh, there's always something new to learn. Uh, and I love thinking like a student. Uh, also, no one can identify every bird, but it is fun to try. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes a photo or a view is just not gonna be good enough. Uh, for every rule I'm gonna talk about tonight, literally every single one of them, there will be an exception. So it's best for us to think typically, usually, or often as opposed to always or never with raptors. Every time we think we've got something um, in the raptor ID group, we'll see um, a bird that blows our minds and, and breaks that rule. And finally, birds have wings. You may think that um, the expected range uh, is something that's very useful in terms of identifying a bird, but just remember that birds have wings and they don't um, observe borders and they, that vagrant sightings happen all the time. 
When we're talking about Raptor ID, it's really a process of elimination in many ways. So I wanted to show these silhouettes here to, to get folks to start thinking about the different buckets that Raptors kind of fall in. And if we can eliminate um, some options and if we can put a, a subject bird into one of these buckets, that can help us really hone in on the ID and, and we don't have to waste time thinking about 20 different species. I just wanna call out some key features of these buckets, and these are not the only ones, but the occipiters are a group of hawks that are known for their long tails. So just observe the length of this tail compared to some of the other proportions. The falcons are uh, well known for their pointed wing shape. So that's something that really stands out on a bird like this. The buteos are broad and long winged hawks and they have shorter tails. So that's something that, that jumps out compared to the proportions of the occipiter. Uh, vultures, another extremely large bird. Notice it's really small head um, and this two dimensional silhouette doesn't really show the dihedral V shape of a turkey vulture, which is a really um, key field mark we'll talk about later. And then the eagles, uh, the eagle has this huge, almost plank-like um, shape, very flat, um, broad, long wings and a really big head and large bill compared to others. So if we can start thinking about these buckets, put a bird into uh, a bucket and then eliminate from there, that's gonna be a great way to build up an ID. All right, so now I'm gonna dive into the species. We'll start with the diurnal raptors. And just to show you kind of, you know, how to think about identification, it's always great to know who your suspects might be. So this is some data from eBird. eBird has these great bar charts, which just talk about the, the population of the birds and, and their frequency. So this chart here is separated uh, between the hawks, the falcons, and the owls. And this is Suffolk County, New York, um, which covers most of um, Long Island, if you're not familiar with the geography. Um, in December, January, and February, it just shows how frequently these birds are seen. So um, the, the bar chart shows that you know, red-tailed hawks, northern harriers are really frequently seen birds, but a golden eagle, in fact, is extremely rare. Um, for the falcons, you know, peregrine falcons and merlin um, are, are regulars. Jeer falcon, sometimes show up here. It's actually a pretty surprising um, frequency for, for jeer falcon, but pretty rare in comparison. And then with the owls, um, this is something I found fascinating. Barred owl, which is a, a bird in my area that's incredibly common, is almost unheard of in, in uh, this county. So that's just something to think about. The, the differences in habitat and environment aren't always obvious. Snowy owls, on the other hand, um, seem to be really re well seen. So. Ebert has great data like this to help you identify what you might expect. We'll start with the Buteos. These hawks have long, broad wings and short tails. The red-tailed hawk is where I like to start because this is the bird that most people are familiar with. Um, they're extremely common in all across North America. They're very you know, prominent birds. You probably have seen one soaring around um, the bright red tail. It's a large Buteo. The key field marks on, on red-tailed hawks are the dark belly band of feathers, these are seen on almost all Eastern birds. And then the dark patagial marks up here on the leading edge of the wings. Those field marks uh, are present on, on most of our red tails. It's a year round resident in this area. The adult red tail has the brick orange top of the tail. You can just barely see in this picture. Um, and they usually have dark eyes. They, they start yellow as a juvenile and they get darker as they age. This bird has kind of some golden eyes. Again, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all the, the field marks I've listed on all these slides tonight, but uh, they are here for you to review and hopefully give you an overview uh, as you come back to these um, slides to, to build up your knowledge about these raptors. And again, these are the basics. And if we can learn the basics well, um, we're gonna be you know, building a, a good foundation. Here's your first you know, lesson about raptor ID. Probably the most common question a raptor person like myself gets asked by the average person is I saw you know, a bird that looked like a red-tailed hawk, but the tail wasn't red. This is the, the juvenile red-tailed hawk, which does not have a red tail, but it does have the other field marks. We talked about the dark belly band of feathers, the patagial bars up here, the long wing shape, the short tail. The red tail juvenile for that first year has many thin dark brown bands and a brown tail. So that is um, really explains a lot of those, that, that very basic question. So if you keep in mind that most uh, juvenile red-tailed hawks don't have a red tail, that's gonna help you, um, you know, just understand that bird and, 
understand that different ages and different species uh, have different marks. Um, different sexes, as we'll see tonight, also have different plumage. Red tails are identical. Uh, from a distance, we can see this red tail hawk. Again, from below the tail, the red tail looks maybe pinkish or, or, or orangish if the light is right. But we can see the belly band, we can see the dark patagial bars. Again, long, broad wings. And this is what we typically see, you know, when we're driving down the highway. Um, you know, this is the bird up in the air. So that's what they look like from a distance. Uh, just some bonus information here again, juvenile red tail hawk. Notice the tail, light brown with the dark brown, uh, thin bands. Red tails generally hunt mammals, uh, but they also take plenty of birds and they're a generalist. So I've seen them go after toads, earthworms, all sorts of good stuff. Um, interesting conservation fact that red tails are susceptible to rat poisons. So when they prey on rats, those poisons may build up in their body and eventually kill them. Red-shouldered hawk, another bird uh, that's in the Budeo group. It's a medium-sized Budeo. Um, pale crescent marks on the outer wings I'm highlighting here are a good field mark at any age. It's a widespread bird in the eastern part of the US. And we also see them in, in the California and the West Coast. It's a year round resident, a little bit less likely to be seen in the winter because some of them do migrate out of the Northeast. The adult is this bird with a rufous barred breast. Um, barring when I use it for raptors, I mean horizontal marks that kind of go across the body versus streaks, which are vertical marks that go uh, up and down. Um, black and white on the tail, a black tail with thin uh, white bands. And then you can see some black and white banding on the flight feathers. Uh, and then in this photo, you see it actually does have a red shoulder uh, on this top leading uh, edge of the wing. Sometimes that's tough to see, but uh, it is there. As a juvenile, um, the red-shouldered hawk. Again, here's the pale crescents I mentioned in the edge of the wing. Uh, underneath it has dark streaks on a pale belly, and the tail uh, generally has um, <clears throat> a dark tail with thin white bands. From a distance, again, here's the pale crescents. These can be seen from quite a ways away, which is a great uh, way to ID your red-shouldered hawk. It looks a lot like a red tail in terms of the shape. Some more info here about how they fly. Flat wings, steady circles. The wings are pushed forward and a little bit blunt at the tips. And here's another juvenile. Again, the pale crescents can be seen on, on the wings here. Conservation fact, red-shouldered hawks are moving northward. They're much more common in the south, but as climate change warms up the northeast, we're more likely to see these birds uh, year round. They eat reptiles and amphibians as well as small mammals and again, generalists. All right, here's our first winter migrant in the Budeo group. This is the rough-legged hawk. This is a large Budeo, effectively the same size as a red-tailed hawk. A couple of key differences, it has feathered legs, which you can't always see, but it comes in light and dark morphs. Um, the rough-legged hawk breeds in the Arctic and it comes down to spend the winter with us. Um, we see them throughout much of the US. They also can be found in Eurasia. Here's the light morph. This is a, generally a pale bird, white overall. It has a, um, the key field mark is this dark carpal patch on the upper area of the wrists of the wing. It has one on each side. And then also they typically have a dark belly, uh, but that can be a, a variable field mark depending on the age and the sex of a light morph rough leg. And they also come in a dark morph, which is the only all dark, um, Budeo in the east, typically. Um, so this bird is all this chocolate brown. They can be even blackish underneath. Um, as a juvenile, they have yellow eyes and they turn darker brown as an adult. From a distance, again, here are those dark carpal patches in the dark belly. Um, so something to keep in mind is that when we're looking at our light morph rough-legged, and the light morph are more common, to so look for these big dark spots in the dark belly. These birds frequently hover over um, the ground uh, to search for prey. So that's something that also is a giveaway. So look for these field marks for the rough leg. Um, open grasslands, these are specialists that really only eat uh, small mammals, but also may scavenge carrion. Conservation fact here that, that rough leggeds may not need to come to the, um, to the Northeastern US in the future if climate change continues um, the, the areas where they were um, you know, or too inhospitable in the winter may become more temperate. So we may not see these birds forever. So those are the three beauties of the winter. We're gonna talk about some exhibitors. 
Excipiters are, are hawks with long tails and short wings. So when we look at the perched excipiter here, we can see the tail is very long and the wing tip only comes to here. So we can see there's a big difference in that, uh, in that distance, which explains you know, the long-tailed bird versus um, a short-tailed bird like a beauty oak. I want to talk about the sharp shin hawk. The sharp shin is a smaller excipiter. Um, small round head, uh, again, the long tail. Um, the tail can look squared off from a distance. And this is not the greatest example of a square tail, but that is the field mark I want you to think about. It's a widespread bird uh, in North and South America, year-round resident up here, but we're less likely to see them in the winter because so many migrate. The adult sharp shin hawk has a grayish blue top. Uh, they can have orange or red eyes. And um, if you see an adult, you want to look for uh, the, the head to be hooded, a dark cap and a dark nape or back of the neck. Juvenile sharp shin hawk um, below has um, streaks. So again, not the easiest to see here, but those streaks are slightly reddish or rufous. The eyes are yellow and um, again, long tail, you can kind of see here. From a distance, a little bit better look at the, the square shape of the tail tip. Um, it's a buoyant bird in flight, um, which means it just gets lift very easily. And exhibitors are known for their flap, flap, glide pattern. So when you think about that, that means flap, flap, and then glide, flap, flap, glide. For sharp chin hawks, their flapping is very rapid. So we're talking about that kind of flap and then a glide. And basically, if those wing beats are too quick to count, that's a great field mark uh, for flight. Uh, so keep an eye on that. If you can count the wing beats, that may be a different bird, which we'll talk about uh, momentarily. Shark and hawks breed in the forest. Um, they typically pursue their prey, which are small birds. Um, and again, another bird here that the, the edge of their breeding range is right about where we are at. So um, changes in the future to our environment could change that, that range. Uh, definitely a bird that struggles uh, from deforestation um, in this area. Okay, so the other exhibitor that I want to talk about is the Cooper's Hawk, a medium-shaped bird. It is, um, has a larger head compared to the Sharp Shin Hawk. It has a more rounded tail tip compared to the Sharp Shin. Um, the torso is more tubular, and uh, those are the key kind of differences. Uh, there are some bonus slides at the end of this presentation to really help you get into the difference between uh, Cooper's hawks and sharp chin hawks. They're incredibly similar, and uh, I hope those slides will be helpful. Uh, it's a year-round resident in the Northeast, widespread in the U.S. and Mexico. The adult coop is, has rufous barring on the breast, pretty well seen here. Again, the horizontal marks. The eyes are orange or red. The top, can't see the top here, but it's a blue-gray typically. Um, and if you see the head of the Cooper's Hawk, it's a dark cap with a pale nape. That means they're going to look capped, whereas the adult sharp shin hawk will look hooded. So these are some field marks in the bonus slides that will become uh, more apparent. The juvenile Cooper's Hawk below has dark streaks. They're teardrop shaped. Uh, again, sort of the roundish tail tip here, a flat leading edge of the wing. Sexes are identical. The eyes of the Juvenile Cooper's Hawk are yellow. These are the guys that you're probably seeing in your backyard at the bird feeder. Again, in flight, here's the rounded tail tip, really well seen here. The flat leading edge, a large head. The torso is tubular. These are the key um, field marks. And then the flight, again, flap, flap, glide. But if you can count the wing beats, flap, 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 glide, that's three flaps, three countable. That less frenetic pace, that's a good field mark for the Cooper's Hawk. Um, again, some bonus information here. They typically breed in the forest, but are doing well in urban and suburban areas like parks, cemeteries. Um, they pursue their prey, um, small to medium-sized birds and small mammals. And you know, back in, in earlier last century, uh, these birds were shot because they were thought to be a threat to livestock or game birds. But uh, fortunately, we've kind of cut that out and the populations have rebounded. All right, we're gonna talk about um, three types of falcons here. Falcons are raptors with narrow pointed wings. The first one I wanna hit is the American kestrel. This is a small falcon, very colorful bird, um, boldly marked face. So check out this face with the two black marks, one under the eye and one kind of 
in the sideburn area. And um, there's different plumages for the two sexes of American kestrels. This is the female, and we'll, we'll walk through those differences in a moment. Widespread in North and South America and a year-round resident, but much less likely to be seen in winter. A lot of kestrels migrate south. The female American kestrel can be identified on the top by their wing color, which is orange with uh, black barring. And underneath they have um, a rufous streaking. Um, the tail, which is not seen well in this picture is orange with many thin black bands. The male American kestrel has a much different look on top. It has blue upper wings. And then below also different. Um, typically we see them with dark spots on their kind of pale, um, pale to buffy um, torso. At a distance, we can just generally see this underside of this female has um, rufous streaking, so that's a, a great field mark. In the tail, again, lots of uh, thin, dark bands. Um, they frequently hover when hunting, um, and uh, quick flickering wing beats are a key there. And then the male from a distance, I can see, if I can catch the top of the wing, I can see that blue, which is definitely unique. Again, the pointed wings for a falcon. Um, some conservation facts, habitat loss is a huge problem for kestrels as we develop um, grasslands and open spaces, as we cut down um, trees that, that have nesting cavities, um, as European starlings continue to um, multiply. All these are factors in kestrel reproduction. So that's something that we are keeping an eye on. They typically hunt small mammals, small birds, and they also eat insects like this uh, female has grabbed a cricket. All right, the Merlin, uh, another small falcon, a little bit bigger than a kestrel. It's um, a stockier bird, again, the pointed wings here. And the, the, the main identifying feature is that this bird is streaked very heavily all over uh, underneath. If you can see the tail, which there's just a hint of it here, a dark tail with many thin pale bands, um, a bird that can be found all over the world, including, uh, fortunately for us, the Northeast, also in Eurasia. In the winter, they can expand as far as uh, Mexico, Central America. Typically a winter migrant here, they don't breed uh, in the Northeast uh, at this latitude. Perhaps, you know, some, a few pairs here and there. The adult male, Merlin, again, everything is, is barred or streaked very heavily below. The adult male, I can see the top of this bird is a bluish gray. All falcons typically have dark eyes or um, dark brown to black. The female and the juvenile of either sex, uh, Merlin look very similar. Again, heavily streaked here. The top is gonna be a, a, a grayish brown. From a distance, um, Merlin are incredibly fast. So you're not gonna get a great look typically when they're flying past you, but if you do catch it, it's gonna look very angular with the pointed wings. And again, just a blur of, of streaks below uh, for a fairly small bird and really cool to see them in flight, very powerful and a very mean bird. They have a great uh, temperament harassing larger, uh, larger birds just for fun, it seems like. Here's a mean looking Merlin. Um, they typically breed in, in, in the forest, but um, you know, they, they have a, a pretty good uh, diversity of habitats, including grasslands and coastal regions. Our pursuit hunter, uh, small birds are the main specialty and they can also catch insects. Another bird that as uh, climate change continues, we may not see them as often. But they also may be moving into urban and suburban areas. They, they eat uh, house sparrows. All right, and the larger falcon yet is the peregrine. Um, again, the big pointed wings, great angles on this bird. It's got a dark helmeted look. Uh, the top side has this dark gray and blue. Uh, peregrine falcon is a widespread bird all over the globe. And around here, it's a year-round resident. Um, you can find it in the winter or summer. Um, the adults, has um, some fine dark barring on the underside. Um, so that's again, the, the horizontally oriented marks, the helmeted look, the dark blue helmet. Again, the top side is dark blue gray. There's some subtle differences between the sexes, but those are pretty hard to, to pick up. The juvenile looks a little bit different. Uh, the colors aren't as, as vivid. It's more of a, a brown gray and it has vertically oriented streaks below. So dark streaking on the juvenile peregrine. Again, dark eyes. In flight from a distance, we might just see this really sharp angular shape. Notice the pointed wings, uh, they're very long and broad. Um, a lot of people know that peregrine falcons are the fastest bird 
um, therefore the fastest animal on earth, according to um, experiments. So if you do catch one, um, you know, just appreciate it because the, the speed displays can be really impressive. Uh, and they're the fastest when they stoop, um, which is diving out of, uh, from a high altitude, usually at, uh, at some prey. Um, they can be found in urban and suburban areas. They do great nesting on tall buildings and structures like a tower or even a construction crane. Um, they hunt uh, almost uh, entirely birds, medium and large size. And a lot of folks probably know that they almost went extinct uh, in this area in the Eastern US in the 50s to the 70s due to pollution. Uh, and then conservationists stepped in Went mute there for a second, I'm back. Um, conservationists stepped in to outlaw um, some of those pesticides and that really helped uh, peregrine falcons bounce back in addition to work um, introducing um, birds from captive stocks and releasing them into the wild. So peregrine falcons are actually doing uh, pretty well in this, uh, in this region. Okay, let's talk about some other raptors um, that don't fit into those three buckets. The bald eagle is uh, one that we'll definitely want to cover for, for this area. It's a, a huge bird, long, broad, flat wings, a large head and a large bill. Most folks know the adult bald eagle with its black body and, and white head and tail um, extremely well, but the everything but the adult eagle uh, is a bit tougher to identify. So I want to talk about those. A bird that's widespread in the U.S. and Canada, a year on resident, and as I said in the beginning, more likely to be seen in the winter. The adult almost unmistakable with the white head, white tail, and then the long plank-like wings, almost like a flying two by four. One thing you may not know is that it takes five years or more for a bald eagle to look like this. And, and every year before that fifth year, they're going to look slightly different. Um, for, from the age of about two years to the fourth year, there'll be a, a wide variety of um, different modeled plumages a combination of black and brown and white on the body and the wings and the tail, tails, bills and eyes all go from dark to eventually white. They eventually end up with a yellow bill, tail eyes and a white tail. But um, in between, they can be any combination of those things. The bonus slides at the end, which again, I hope you'll, you'll check out after the presentation, um, have some more clues about aging bald eagles. The juvenile first year birds, even different than that. It has a, a tawny or orange brown belly, typically white in the wing pits and the underwing coverts, and uh, a dark head, dark tail with a bunch of modeling. And all the individuals are different. So it's a very interesting bird to, uh, to observe. In flight from a distance, again, big plank like wings, the white head seen, can be seen from an incredible distance. Um, and then the, a little bit tougher for the immatures. But again, the same general shape, plank-like large wings, big, slow circles, uh, a slow flying bird, which helps you get an appreciation for how big they actually are. And they're typically unbothered in the wind, which is uh, pretty cool to observe. Bald eagles came off the endangered species list in, in 2007, so they're another great conservation story in the US. Typically, they're always, almost always found near water. They eat fish. Uh, large birds like ducks and geese, and they also scavenge really well. Can be very social in the winter. You might see them hanging out together. The Northern Harrier is a pretty unique raptor. Um, we see them a lot in open grasslands. It's a, a long-winged, long-tailed bird. Uh, every age class has some white feathers at the top of the tail, the tail, upper tail coverts, uh, which we can just effectively call the rump. It has a white rump at any age. Um, widespread in, in North America and and a year round resident, but more likely to be seen in the winter. The adult male is a really cool bird, um, kind of hard to find, but it's uh, the top side is, is a, a beautiful pale gray, below um, a, a white with um, different model streaking, bright yellow eyes, and birders nickname this bird the gray ghost. The adult female, vastly different bird, heavily streaked below on the breast and the torso, and also streaked in this patagial area. Um, and then the flight feathers banded, a, a yellow eye as, a, as the adult. And then the juvenile birds, um, similar to the adult female, but more orange below, more unstreaked in the body and, and in the wings. Um, 
But again, a white rump, can't really see it too well here, but um, it is there. You can sex juvenile harriers by their eye color. If you can see them, the males start yellow and the females start brown. This bird looks pretty brown, so probably a juvenile female. Um, and from a distance, the top side of the, the adult male, the gray ghost, see dark wingtips, the silvery gray top, white rump. Flight style, very key for this bird, low and slow. The brown type, so the females and juveniles can look very similar from a distance. Um, you know, streaking or, or orange below, low and slow. White rump as well. And again, open grasslands or coastal areas. Uh, they specialize in mammals, but will also take birds. And harriers are generally in decline due to habitat loss. Again, there's not as much open land or grassland as there used to be. We've got two species of vultures in the Northeast. Um, the turkey vulture is the predominant one, large raptor. The wings are held in a dihedral or a V shape at almost, almost all the time. Uh, widespread in North and South America. And key feature, the small um, unfeathered or feather, <laughs> featherless head that can be red as an adult. Now, uh, flight feathers are actually silver on, uh, silvery on uh, turkey vultures. The rest of the body is this dark brown. Again, the, the head um, reddish as an adult juvenile has grayish. And they can be very social. You see them in these big groups soaring together in circles. And uh, another key uh, is the teetering flight. They wobble back and forth. Um, turkey vultures are at risk from lead poisoning, believe it or not. Uh, lead can build up in hunter um, leftovers from lead ammunition, and, and that lead can get into a turkey vulture body and kill it. Um, key behaviors, again, a scavenger entirely scavengers. They don't go after live prey, although there's probably an exception out there, but for the most part, consider it a scavenger. Um, again, soaring, dihedral, social bird. The black vulture is another bird we're starting to see in the Northeast a little bit more. They're expanding out of the Southeast and South America. And as climate change warms up, they are feeling more and more comfortable in the North. Uh, my hometown is a place, uh, Amsterdam, New York, which is a few hours North of, of the North Fork. Um, but, you know, I've never seen a, a black vulture until a couple of years ago, and they're definitely expanding their area. Um, like a turkey vulture, mostly dark, but they have these uh, silvery primary patches. The tail is shorter and square. Uh, at a distance, you can really see those little uh, patches. Conservation fact, again, they're moving northward. Again, another social bird, just like turkey vultures, spend a lot of time soaring and scavenging uh, for dead stuff. Okay, let's talk about some owls, four owls that we typically are going to see in the North Fork area in the winter. The first is the great horned owl. This is people, most people think of this as the prototypical owl shape, big body with the big ear tufts, uh, big yellow eyes, torso is wide and stout. The plumage is this brown mottled uh, color, it makes them very hard to see. They are incredibly widespread in, in North America. There are some subtle differences between the sexes um, and also adults um, and juveniles. The juveniles don't have as long of the ear tuft. They take some time to grow. These birds mostly hunt um, mammals. Uh, Eastern screech owl, another bird that we see in the Northeast. Uh, smaller owl, definitely has the ear tufts. Uh, again, yellow eyes. And they come in three different color morphs, um, gray, red, or even brown. So um, you can see screech owls in those different coats of feathers. Widespread in the east, east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, hence eastern. If you are west of the Rockies, you'll get a western screech owl. Um, the sexes are generally identical, and it's actually not related to the plumage morphs. So you could have a male gray, a female gray, male red, female red, et cetera. A year-round resident that typically does not migrate. Uh, the snowy owl um, is a very large bird. Uh, again, well-built stout torso and striking uh, all white plumage. Um, depending on the age and sex, they also can have some variable black brown barring or spotting uh, on the front and top side. This is a bird that breeds in the Arctic and is an irregular visitor to the northern US and Canada. Uh, but during eruptive seasons, they can really widely fluctuate uh, and can show up in large numbers in an area like uh, Long Island. This photo is from a uh, captive. Release, a release of a captive wild bird that was 
uh, banded at Logan Airport in, in Boston. They are a winter migrant, so they're really only here for the winter, and then they head back up north. And most birds that, that we see uh, in our area are, are juvenile birds that are um, expanding out from their, um, their home territory where they were born. Finally, the short-eared owl is a bird that we can see um, in the winter in this area, a medium-sized bird with very long wings. Uh, the face is very distinct on this bird, a pale facial disc, um, yellow eyes and these dark triangles behind the eyes. The plumage is almost a sandy brown and uh, well-marked. Widespread bird all over the world, uh, including um, Eurasia. And I've actually seen these birds on a trip to Hawaii, believe it or not. Uh, subtle differences between the sexes, Juveniles and adults are extremely similar. So those are the four regular owls. And let's talk about some rarities. The golden eagle, an infrequent visitor to uh, the area, but uh, certainly not uh, impossible to see them. Uh, it's similar to a bald eagle in shape, but some key differences, a smaller head, the golden nape, the feathers in the back of the head, not seen so well here. Um, they also have variable white modeling in the body and tail. And from a distance, again, here's a white um, base of the tail for this juvenile eagle and some white in the ends of the wings. They're never white in the wing pits. And here's a notice this, the head is smaller uh, than the bald eagle. The Northern goshawk uh, is a large exhibitor that is uh, very rarely seen outside of the forest, but should be mentioned because they're so awesome. Uh, again, exhibitor, so a long tailed bird which Blue gray top below, very fine barring, and uh, the extremely deep red eyes. I'm just going to pause for a second. I'm getting an internet connection unstable message. Okay. And again, these images were donated uh, to me to use in this presentation. Thank you very much. As a juvenile, similar to Cooper's hawk, but uh, a lot of streaks below, long tail, um, but the wings are broader and have a different shape. So this is a great uh, slide to study if you've got a chance. And in flight, again, a long tail, broad wings. Finally, I want to talk about the Jir falcon, the largest falcon in, in this area, and a very rare visitor in the winter. Another bird that breeds in the Arctic and, and will visit us very rarely in the Northeast. They come in white, gray, or dark morphs. The gray is the most common, and that's the bird pictured here. And at a distance, they're similar to peregrine falcons, but larger. They have a more of a football-shaped torso and their wingtips are a little bit blunter um, than the peregrine. So I'm gonna hit up a few owls and then we'll be done with the species. Long-eared owl, a bird of the forest, similar to a great horned owl, generally with uh, the large ear tufts, but slimmer, smaller, and longer wings. Uh, these are very secretive birds, tough to see. Rufus facial disc, you can find them in North America and Eurasia. And a winter migrant, so really only seen in winter in this area, the barn owl, in Long Island is another possibility, a uh, really striking bird, medium-sized owl, pale heart-shaped face, dark eyes, sandy top, uh, pale below with these uh, very uh, fine specks, another global, globally uh, populous bird, similar, uh, subtle differences between the sexes and ages, year-round resident. And finally, the Northern Sawwet Owl, a, this is a captive bird seen at a banding demonstration, a real small owl, notice, not, notable for its large round head. Again, yellow eyes on this bird. Um, can be found in all over the, the, the US and, and parts of Canada and Mexico. And uh, another migrant. Um, they, can, they do breed in this area to some extent, but more likely to be found in the winter. All right, that was your crash course in the species of raptors. Just some really quick points here. Um, I do recommend some media for raptor identification. Um, there's a few books that are key to my library and I refer to them uh, almost daily uh, for beginners. And again, I think learning the basics well is a huge part of a good ID foundation. So this is one of the books I use the most, the Crossley ID Guide, uh, a great $25 investment. they got great photos and quizzes. Uh, if you're an intermediate raptor identifier, you need to know the Ligori books, uh, Hawks from Every Angle and Hawks at a Distance. These will 
show you the reality of, of hawk watching and observing raptors in the environment at a distance and from any possible angle. For the advanced uh, student of raptors, you may wanna check out the new Wheeler Guide. Uh, for anybody at any age and any interest level, get the Raptor ID app. This is put out by Hawkwatch International and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It is free for your smartphone or tablet. It has 34 species, incredible photos, it has video. Uh, this is essential Raptor identification equipment. I use it every day. Organizations to know, again, thank you to the North Fork Audubon Society, the regional, regional Audubon chapter, and again, that your donations um, are what make programming like this possible. So uh, I appreciate anything that you can give to support this organization. And my organization, Eastern Mass Hawk Watch, uh, a regional group of, of, of hawk watchers, you can learn about what we do at our website. I'll just name a couple others for you to check out. Cornell Lab, who runs eBird and All About Birds and other great programs. Hawk Watch International, they run the Raptor ID app and do some great field work based out of Utah. Uh, Hamana, the Hawk Migration Association in North America, they run, they run hawkcount.org, mostly focused on migration. And that's it. Bonus slides for you to check out later are about Accipiter ID, Sharpies and Coops. Doesn't look that hard, right? Um, I'll, these slides will, will help you uh, get some, some fine details. So that's what I wanted to talk about in just a little bit over time, but we've got some time for questions. So hope you all enjoyed that whirlwind tour. All right. Uh, I'm going to just start picking some questions out of the uh, chat. Uh, advice and strategies on how to observe owls. Um, great question. You got to be familiar with the habitat that the owls are in. Um, you, you know, learn what type of, of uh, forests uh, that they roost in or different environments. Um, eBird's a great resource to find hot spots where these species have been found in the past. Um, and I think um, that there's, there's no uh, exchange, there's no um, replacing patience. Um, it's it's going to take um, an investment of time uh, to, to uh, observe roosting owls because they're so secretive. They're doing everything they can to avoid being seen by us. Any guesses as to why ospreys are seldom seen out in North Fork? Uh, I've actually never been to this area, um, so I don't know the habitat, but yeah, ospreys are, you know, they're looking for certain conditions um, to breed. They're also kind of, they breed in colonies. So um, it's, it's possible that um, either the food availability is not as optimal. Um, there's competition from other species like bald eagles or you know, peregrine falcon. Uh, there could be interference from human factors, um, fishing operations, um, busy beaches. Um, there's different factors there. I'm not, I would be just speculating without knowing the, the environment uh, too, too well. All right. Thoughts on the snowy owl in Central Park? Uh, super cool. Um, snowy owls are, uh, uh, again, like I was talking about a winter migrant. So they are looking for um, hunting grounds to spend the winter. They're looking for safe places to avoid predators. They're looking to avoid competition from other snowy owls. So I'm sure the snowy owl flew over Central Park and said, oh, look, there's probably no snowy owls down there. Um, you know, I, I saw a picture of it near a baseball field, a wide open space. It, it's, it's very unusual to see them in, in that kind of environment, but it does happen. The winter of 2013 to 2014 is probably the biggest snowy owl eruption in most of our lifetimes. Um, and in the Boston area, I saw multiple snowy owls in the heart of Boston and in um, on the roofs of buildings. Uh, if you've ever been to Harvard University, I saw a snowy owl on a rooftop in, in Harvard Square. You know, um, crazy things can happen when there are so many birds coming down from the north um, that they need space, they need hunting grounds, and they'll try pretty much anything. 
Um, heard you mention cemeteries earlier. Any other good places outside of parks to view raptors? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you asked that one. It'll be hard to believe, but one of my favorite spots to bird in Boston, and folks on this uh, presentation who know me know this is true, is, is the grocery store. I often bird in front of the grocery store near where I live because uh, folks there feed pigeons and um, the pigeons stay year round at the grocery store. Uh, at the beginning of the winter, there may be 250 pigeons. And then by the end of winter, there may be 75. And that's because raptors come in all day long to take pigeons. I've seen uh, eight different species of raptors come to the grocery store. Uh, Peregrine falcon, red-tailed hawk, and cooper stock are the most common ones. Um, but believe it or not, that's where I have my most consistent luck seeing raptors. That is the grocery store. So my lesson here would be find the prey. If you're looking to see a red-shouldered hawk, find out what they're into, reptiles and amphibians. So maybe a swamp is the right environment. If you're looking for peregrine falcon or cooper socks, check the grocery store or check any place where pigeons gather. Right. Do red-tailed hawks return to the same nests each year? Um, great question. They can, they don't necessarily. Um, they often will defend the same territory um, and they can also build multiple nests on the same territory. So uh, they may go from a nest on that territory one year and then the next year use the alternate nest or they may stay in the same one over and over again. Um, they're very picky and um, it's not com probably completely well known as to why they choose which nest, but it's very normal to see them switch it up. It's very normal for them to have decoy nests. Um, especially during spring, you may see them building. Um, they may just do some repairs to a nest site. They may start building and change their mind. Uh, for Cooper socks, I've seen a, a male build an entire nest um, for weeks and have the female after that time just build their own nest and, and choose that, that one instead of the one that was completely finished. So, it, it's uh, not entirely known. All right, I, I've heard screech and horn, great horned owls at night in winter, but not this year. Do you think they lost their nesting habitat? Um, so good question. Um, I think, you know, hearing owls is definitely way more common than seeing them. And they, they do move around, even though I mentioned that these two species, Eastern screech owl and great horned owl are not migrants, meaning they should be in the same general area year round, they, they, they can wander. Um, if there's competition, they can move around. And if you actually herd those two species together, make sure that you're aware that great horned owls eat screech owls. So it's possible that the great horned owl made a meal out of the screech. And um, that's a, one scenario. But um, you know, if you know that there's holes that have been used in the past by a screech owl or you know pine trees that have been used for a roost by great horned owls, just know that there's something intrinsic about that tree or environment that makes it appealing to those owls. So different individuals could come back to that same spot um, year after year. So that's just something to keep in mind that the, there's something about that spot that is good for screech owls. So even if the same individuals are gone, um, a different one might come back. Uh, let's see, typical predators for hawks and owls are each other. Um, you know, so the bigger hawk can eat a smaller hawk. Um, for nesting birds, um, you can see mammals like a fisher uh, or raccoon, um, you know, I'm not sure what other martins, things like that. Tree dwelling mammals could, could predate nests. Um, you know, certain parts of the world, snakes or, or reptiles, again, could be eating eggs. Um, and then, you know, most likely, likely predator for all raptors is man. Um, you know, even though you'd think that the hunting of birds of prey, which is federally illegal in any way in the United States, you know, with extremely limited exceptions, you think that'd be enough to stop the shooting of birds of prey, but that happens all the time. And, and um, you know, in New York state too, obviously. Um, so, you know, that, that's a factor and that will, will always be the leading cause of death for raptors, whether it's directly or indirectly through development, pollution, et cetera. Do ospreys return to the same nest each year? Do they mate for life? I believe they mate for life. Don't quote me on that. Um, I believe that, again, they typically will try to use the same nest 
Um, but there is less of a guarantee there because OSPI are total migrants in this area. They go to South America and the Caribbean for the winter and then they come back. So not every bird's gonna make it back. And if a bird comes back sooner than um, its neighbor, it may take the better spot. So there is probably some degree of competition coming back. They can't defend that nest all winter, can't defend that territory, but they are comfortable nesting in colonies fairly close to each other. So you might see that, that they may pick a, a nest close uh, to last year's. Do all raptors have exciting mating displays? It's a good question. I don't know if all of them do. Um, birds like golden eagles, um, which don't mate around here for the most part, uh, do some incredible aerials. Uh, bald eagles do things like locking talons and, and falling to the ground. Cooper's hawks are a bird I'm pretty familiar with. They do an intricate dance where the male bows before the female um, to uh, initiate mating. Um, so the, yeah, there's some cool stuff out there. Um, Red-tailed hawks, again, different aerial displays, northern harrier, similarly. Um, I'm not sure, not so sure about owls, uh, shorted owl. It's a bird that does a cool display called the wing clap. They um, clap their wings in front of their bodies in a dive. So they go up great altitude and then dive down and they clap their wings together. If you've ever had a chance to hear that, it is really cool. Are we right in thinking that eagles sometimes kill ospreys? Absolutely. Uh, that's just the, the bigger bird. They're competitors fighting for the same resources, the same prey. And if you go to YouTube, type in that phrase, you will see an incredible video of a bald eagle uh, grabbing an osprey nestling out of, off the nest. Um, heartbreaking, but absolutely happens. And that may not even be for food, that may just be for um, you know, competition. It may just be eliminating the competition. All right, getting close to the bottom of the list of questions. Keep them coming if you got them. All right, we're getting a, a donation from Lois. Thank you so much. Again, more questions about owls. You know, I think just a key thing to think about as you're looking for owls is, is, is to keep ethics in mind. Going back to my first slide, you know, learn about what is the risk to a, a roosting owl. Typically, they're nocturnal birds that are trying to avoid being seen during the day. So you know, we wanna make sure that we're not disturbing them. We wanna make sure that they're allowed to, to sleep and rest uh, so they can hunt at night. Um, so just keep that in mind that um, it's a sensitive species at all times. So uh, the search for them um, has gotta be done carefully. Got a hand raised. Let me see if I can get an audio question. Not sure how this works. All right, any other volunteering opportunities Hawkwatch or others may need help with? Every organization needs volunteers. Um, find what, what you're passionate about. Hawk watching is ultimately the, the, the counting of migrant raptors. And we can only do that when they're migrating in the spring and fall. Um, so, you know, every hawk count, every hawk migration site is always looking for people. Um, to volunteer. Um, if you've got the time, um, I guarantee you that someone will be interested. Uh, wildlife rehabilitators are always looking for volunteers to help with the, the maintenance and feeding of injured birds of prey. Um, that's another great resource and you get hands-on experience, which can't be beat. And then the Audubon uh, local chapters like North Fork uh, have, have tons of opportunities for citizen science. Um, the more bodies, the better. Do birds of prey mate for life? Generally, yes, but not completely. Um, interesting studies have recently been shown that uh, like Cooper's hawks, uh, something like up to a third of um, chicks that were checked in a DNA study have different DNA than their father. So um, extra paternal parent, I'm not sure what the right word is for that, but that happens way more than we thought. And with DNA testing getting cheaper, easier, and more reliable, we can learn things like that. So 
Cooper's Hawks may think they're mating for life, but the reality is, is far different. What's your opinion on feeding birds in parks? Great question. Um, I think that that is a really interesting thing to consider, you know, the ethics of, of bird feeding and how that affects the environment. Uh, I'm not a regular, um, I don't regularly maintain a feeder, but um, when you're thinking about, you know, is, is, is using a bird feeder, you know, does that benefit my birds of my environment? Now you're thinking critically and you're thinking with ethics in mind. I, I love that train of thought and whatever you decide, I think is, is right. There's plenty of evidence that, that feeding birds at a bird feeder is, is beneficial and important. But of course, you know, it can cause issues. It can spread disease um, <laughs> in my house. Um, I remember at the beginning of uh, the coronavirus uh, lockdown, I had a bird feeder for about a week before I realized I was feeding mostly rats underneath it. Um, so, you know, all sorts of things to keep in mind. Yeah, it can also attract raptors. That's what I was hoping for. Uh, any other Instagrams I'm a fan of? Um, yeah, oh, tons. Check out my, my followers. Uh, list um, on Instagram. I think that that's, um, I, I really tried to, you know, th there's so many great accounts out there. Um, I, I can't think of one to, to name, but um, you can get tons of great information from different societies, organizations, wildlife rehabbers. Uh, I follow all those types of accounts. Would you consider speaking to Audubon members group in the future on Long Island? Of course. All right, we're at the end of the questions. We're a little bit over time. Yes, well, that was perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. And uh, again, if anybody has any questions or wants to be added to our email list, it's info at northforkaudubon.org. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good night. All right, adios. Thanks, Brian. Brian, where can we find your slides? Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're, we're attempting to host them on the North Fork Audubon Society website. And I also have a copy on my personal website. Um, so I'm just gonna browse over to the North Fork site right now and see if I can track them down for you. There's actually, uh, there was a link in the chat, but it is um, already posted under the event page for the Winter Raptor ID. It's a uh, button that says Winter Raptor ID with Brian. Yep, that's it right there. Um, so that's already on the page. I also posted it to our, our Hawk Watch as a resource since we're just getting that you know, off the ground. That's accessible. And when we're done, we will also post the recording of this program. Thank you so much. So yeah, northforkaudubon.org, and then you can click on um, um, about Hawk Watch or on the events page, chapter ID here, and it's uh, this, this green button. And on my website, it's on the resources section. Thanks so much, Brian. That Thank was you. terrific. Awesome. I'm glad you liked it. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Does your uh, website have contact information for you? Yeah, yeah. Website. My website is my name, brianrusnicka.com, R-U-S-N-I-C-A. And I believe your website is also posted on that same Winter Raptor ID. Great. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Brian. We'll, we'll hopefully see you in spring. That would be great. Have a good one. Super. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.